so uh, thanks for everyone online and uh, in person. Thanks for having me here at um, Sydney. It's been a very productive couple of weeks. And um, I'll be talking today about uh, what I've been working and finishing up here um, on my visit uh, to SMRI. Uh, this is joint work with Juji Dancho, who's here in Sydney. So I apologize to her colleagues who've maybe heard some version of this talk. I promise they'll, they've probably heard a better version of it from her. And uh, and Ava Halacheva, who's now at Northeastern, used to be a postdoc at um, Northeastern. Great. So what we're going to talk about um, is a notion of expansions, um, which is something that is unfamiliar to me. So I'm an algebraic topologist. Uh, and this is some low dimensional topology. And then things that completions, this part comes from rational homotopy theory. So uh, closer to my heart. And then automorphisms of um, and some particular groups of symmetries that I'm really interested in uh, that have implications for some homotopy theory and arithmetic geometry. So this talk is a little all over the place. Um, I mean, hopefully not, like if I pull it off, but um, it's got a lot of things in the background. So let's talk about like the motivation and um, where, where the background comes from. So, um, so this is motivation of how this problem arose, not necessarily my motivation. I'll try to tell you that along the way. So expansions are a type of, or universal finite type invariants are something that come up in knot theory. And the idea is that you'll have some knotted, some class of knotted objects, K. So uh, tangles, braids in one example, um, or more complicated things that happen in three manifolds. And you want your class of knotted objects to have some type of finite presentation of some kind of algebraic object. And I'll, that, that notion of a finite presentation of a class of knotted objects is something I'm going to make precise today. Uh, maybe one of the things I'll make most precise. Today. And then what you do is you construct basically, so this now has some type of algebraic structure. And you construct a homomorphism to a space that is like canonically associated with your knotted objects and associated graded, um, which is usually some type of Jacobi diagram or um, B diagram. So some, some kind of computationally friendly space. And this is a way to construct knot invariants. So this is uh, Juju's expertise here um, in quantum topology. And we're building on um, a really interesting example that was due to Dror Barnaton in uh, 96, where he could look at expansions of braids. So these are in quotes because I really want parenthesized braids. And so my braids carry some little extra data that make them inherently like tangles or um, not. So we're using braids as a standard for a knotted object. And we showed that expansions are in one to one correspondence with something called Drenfield associator. Um, so what's, what Dror was in, interested in, in doing this um, was that, in fact, it's really, really hard to construct an expansion, like if you want to construct some type of universal not in there. Um, by making this bijection between expansions and Drenfield associators, you could say that one exists, right? Uh, because we know that an associator exists. And why might that be cool, right? Why might this connection between topology and algebra be useful to you? So one thing that's great about with the associators and what the automorphisms part of our, of our discussion today is that we know there exists, uh, so Drenfield constructed in a series of papers, but I think uh, GT and GRT, uh, a bunch of groups. So the growth into Tykenu and group, GT, uh, and this is a pro-unipotent version or rational version. And it's associated graded group. So the R stands for graded. Um, <laughs> that's a, and the GRT. And these two groups act freely and transitively on associators. So associators is a torsor under these two group actions. And what's useful about that now, I constructed my expansions. I uh, know one exists because I know there exists an associator. And now I have these groups that have a really explicit finite presentation and I can just act on that associator and now I can construct an infinite number of um, expansions, associators, et cetera, right? 
I just, it's something but times GT or GRT, depending on which side you like to act on. All right, so that's, that's a useful thing for not theory. Um, I should say if some of you have seen me talk before, there's also a sort of different version of GT, which is uh, so finite and contains the offsuit Gala group. So there's also like some arithmetic information playing around in here, but I decided to delete it from today's talk. Okay, so this is why it might be a great idea to take some very complicated topological invariant, make it algebraic, and act on it in these sort of symmetry ways. And in fact, there's a higher dimensional analog of the statement. So um, now if I replace my knotted objects, okay, with um, literally something called a uh, welded I'm spelling. Uh, no, I'm not this time. I tend to misspell things when they get nervous and students tend to find, a, find it hilarious. Uh, so welded foams, which are just a class of, and I'll make this, this will be something we're going to discuss quite precisely today. So these are knotted tubes in R4. So higher dimensional and literally higher dimensional. Um, if I replace braids, um, standing in for like classical knots or tangles with uh, welded foam. And you want to construct an expansion now to some new associated graded space, to some kind of algebraic space where I can do uh, computations. So um, Drawer and Juji, uh, they showed that, in fact, you can say that these expansions are one-to-one -one correspondence with this interesting conjecture, um, so this Kashiwarburn conjecture in Lee all right, so now this happens to have a solution, and right? there exists a, a solution to the Cauchy-Gordon equations. Therefore, there exists an expansion. Um, and I decided I'm not sure how much to say about it, because um, it's actually quite interesting thought in its own right, and I'm not an expert in Lean theory. So the short version of Cauchy-Gordon is in a non-commutative setting. It's about can you write down e to the x times e to the y? Um, in a nice way. So this is the Campbell Baker Hausdorff series, so an infinite series. But in practice, even though that's very explicit, it's not very easy to work with. Okay. So the KV um, problem asks, can you find two convergent power series A and B that like will express this? Right. So in practice, what you actually do is look at automorphisms of, of some free Lie algebra that satisfy a nice um, divergence or trace condition and um, find solutions there. Um, and so the, um, there's a great series of papers. Um, so by Alexiev and Tarasian and Alexiev Enriquez Tarasian that discuss, um, I think the first solution or the most general solution was due to Alexiev and um, Men, Men Rankin, I think I pronounced that incorrectly, and this is going to be recorded, so I apologize for that. Um, <laughs> but uh, in 2006, and, um, but these series of papers actually also um, noticed that there was a connection. This, so this big diagram here, which is kind of our story today, between Drenfield dissociators and solutions to the Kashiwara equation. So given a Drenfield dissociator, I can construct a solution to the Kashiwa. But these guys live in different spaces. So one is really a higher dimensional analog than another. So in the algebraic setting, um, Kashiwa is a problem about automorphisms of the free Lie algebra on two letters. And in the um, and dreadful associators are about automorphisms of the Lie algebra of infinitesimal braids, so the dreadful corner Lie algebra. So it's not free. So they're very different objects, but they kind of have similar flavor. Um, all right. So the question is about how to make this diagram work. And I'll be talking about, oh, that's the eraser. <laughs> I'll be talking about these groups today. Right. So my goal is to understand these symmetry groups. Like we talked about why it would be good to understand GT and GRT for, from a topological point of view, and also to, um, for another one. And the other question is, well, they live in a different space, but they have such a nice formula. Can I, can I make this an actual diagram? So let me, 
Right. So the motivation for this project, um, or like, yeah, the motivation for this product is about, well, maybe I can find a nice formal setting that's somehow neither topological nor algebraic. Um, so that all the objects in this diagram live in some same space. I want to make these this map maybe a homomorphism and set the whole world uh, into one place, and I can understand the relationship better between these guys. And that would it right for if you're a topologist and saying, can we look at two and four dimensional knot theory in in some sort of universal way? And if you're an algebraist, it's really can I discuss these groups? So our ultimate goal, which I didn't write down, is to show there's a conjecture, in fact, that this group KRV um, is a twist of GRT. In other words, that every Kashiwara Verne solution is just a associator plus a twist. Right? Um, and twist is literally like a multiplication by, by the field K. So um, that's the ultimate goal from setting this in one place. Can I make a homomorphism and split it off? I still do not know the answer to that, so we won't say it today. All right. So what will we do today? So I wanted to do um, something very tangible that was not a whole list of equations. So I'm going to give you a bunch of pictures and a categorical model for these W foams, right? a way to understand what I mean by knotted tubes in R4 that is sort of um, really abstract. And then I want to show that, in fact, um, there exist symmetry groups um, that are just automorphisms of the two ends of an expansion. So an expansion will be an auto. If I, if I introduce this right, um, my expansions will be isomorphisms between a rational completion of whatever foams are and it's associated graded. Um, and then they all just have symmetries uh, of rational completions acting on both sides. So that's what, what's going on today. Right. Um, so that's the overview. And now I'll be a little bit precise. So uh, please stop me at any time because I don't, I have a goal in mind, but if we don't get there, that's fine. At least you'll learn like some definition. Okay. So let's be precise. So I wanted to find a circuit algebra. So this is a definition um, that appeared in Draw and Judy's paper um, back in 2016. Um, and uh, what it is, is a generalization of a planar algebra. So if you've seen a planar algebra um, in the sense of Von Jones's thing, then this will look like a sort of non-planar planar algebra. And if you have it, then that's fine. So let's first define a diagram or a wiring diagram, um, connection diagram, or non-planar tangle, whatever you want. All right, so let's start with a disk with some holes. So I'm just going to punch out um, the interior of some disjoint interior disks. I don't, I don't want the boundaries to touch you, so disk with holes. And on each of the boundaries of my disks, I'm going to make sets of distinguished points. So I put them with these little red X's here. Right? And these, this is a stand-in for a labeling of um, some arbitrary points on, on the disk. Then I'll add the data of an immersed one manifold. So that's what's in purple here. Um, so one manifold with boundary. And I always want Today, I'm not going to draw arrows because it's already kind of cluttered. I always want this to be oriented. Um, it doesn't have to be. Um, I can talk to Sophie about that. Uh, but um, for today, these are all oriented. And then I want to include a bijection um, between the boundary of the one manifold and the distinguished points. Right? So this is just a way to say that I know where everything goes. I should say that while I've had an immersed one manifold, this is independent. I mean, the, the specific immersion is not part of the data. Like really, I'm just trying to give a, a combinatorial definition and the combinatorics are a little difficult. So you add a immersion or one manifold to like track things. And later I'll give a equivalence with a type of abstract graph. You could also use that if you want to. Okay. So, Wiring diagrams are something called a colored operad. 
Um, so what is an operad? It's a type of algebraic object. So it's a sequence of spaces together with um, some partial compositions, which I've drawn an example here, that parameterize um, other types of addition or multiplication, some kind of algebraic operation. Okay, so in our, our practice, so I'm going to say that what I want to think about is each of these disks, my little wiring diagram or non-planar tangle, is going to be giving me some kind of instruction for how to tensor together a bunch of vector spaces. Right, so I'm going to have vector spaces that are indexed by the points on the boundary of this disk. Um, and planar algebras are called box spaces. They're just, they're just random vector spaces, and they have some name. And the wiring here is some instruction for how to combine them. Now, an operad gives you a systematic way of basically function composition, a way to like compose multilinear operations like this. Okay, so one of the examples, so here I have circ one. So here's my outside one, which means I'm going to take this disk labeled one, and I am going to, um, and because I have matching points on the boundary, I'm going to shrink this guy and shove it in that disk, and then erase the boundary at the composition. So what that, what that actually is, is, is function composition. What I have done is say, like, if I had, um, this is a tensoring of three vector spaces. And now I have mapped a tensoring of two vector spaces into one. So it's, it's a multilinear function composition. Okay, and of course this one is chosen arbitrarily, it ranges over the number of all disks in the big disk. So if you've seen planar algebras, this is exactly like the operat of planar tangles that Jones defines. It's just that, again, we don't have planar connection diagrams and I have no weird shading or any of that stuff. Yes, yeah, the, the labels um, should be like equidistant on the points and they have to match. Yeah, you have to keep track of labels for sure. Um, um, so if you're doing this topologically, you have to also make sure they're sort of spaced properly and do some deformations. But if you're just doing it combinatorially, you still want the labels on the boundaries to match. Um, for sure. So there's there's actually quite a lot of data in this. It's it's a really nasty thing to write down precisely. Well, it's not the worst, but it's certainly not my favorite activity. Um, so an, a circuit algebra is going to be an algebra over this operad, which is just another way of saying representation of this thing. So um, it's, it's more like a representation. But what it is, is a family of linear maps where for every diagram, D, so this is a diagram, I tensor up a bunch of vector spaces um, based on the interior points. So let me get my red. So here, K1, this will be the number of points, or even better, as the specific label set of the points, if we're being really precise, on disk one, interior disk one. This N will be the number of points or um, if you're keeping track of the specific ordered label set or unordered label set, um, the labels, will be the labels on the outside of the disk. The big disk. Now here, V of K1, I'm telling you, this is some vector space that I have associated to this, um, this first circle. And V of KM will be, you know, each one of the VKs will be a vector space again, sort of like think of it as like a decoration of the, the whole. Okay. And the diagram tells me how to multiply so that I land in VN, which is the vector space corresponding to all the outside labels. And um, then we want such 
multiplications to just be compatible with any circle, any of these partial composition operations. So if I paste two wiring diagrams together, I want this to induce compatible maps. So even if it looks a little weird at first, it's an extremely convenient way to package an enormous algebraic problem. And we're going to see one, um, a topological example of such things uh, very soon, rather explicitly. So a homomorphism of circuit algebra, this, is, this definition we won't really need, but it's here for completeness. This is again just a, this is going to be a sequence of a family of vector space maps, um, set maps, whatever. So indexed by the number of, by the labels on various label sets. So I just chose N for numbers because I wasn't very specific, but you always want to choose a proper alphabet, et cetera. And that that's going to be compatible with every uh, multiplication induced by each wiring type. So it's basically the only thing a homomorphism of such a thing should be. All right, and so we can form a category, um, which we'll call C. All right, so here's an example of why you might want such a big, ugly structure. All right, so if you want to have um, these topological or knotted objects, so they, we need them somehow to be finitely presented. So what I'm saying is, imagine you want to write down all tangles or all knots. So You've probably seen these um, Reitermeister theories where you project, you know, knots onto circles and you have over and under crossings, etc. Well, that's a big thing, right? It's an enormous class of objects. So, yeah, um, how do I write them down in a way that I can construct invariants, you know, sort of by um, finite things? I want to take each over crossing goes somewhere, each under crossing goes. Somewhere. Right, so this is a way to do that. So this is a way, a circuit algebra is a way to package a class of topological objects. So here, a W foam. So we're gonna say this is a tangled surface in R4, um, which allows for things called foamed vertices, uh, which are certain singular um, spaces. So what will this look like? What are some of the things that can happen? Um, so I'll be describing this uh, foam, I'll be giving you an explicit one in a second, but just to give some intuition um, for what the symbols I'm drawing on the next slide are, uh, right, what are some things that can happen? I can have two tubes, so you'll tell I'm an algebraic topology, not a real one, right, by my drawings, they get worse <laughs> as it goes on. So um, this here, I'm trying to pick two tubes that are like just passing by each other in R4, so there's no intersection at all, they're just passing by. So if you were to project that down onto the page, right, we wouldn't really be, um, we, we wouldn't really be depicting anything. So we'll write that as what is sometimes called a virtual crossing and not theory, just, I'm just going to write them as like passing by each other. And then these are the, the arrows will be the orientation of the two. Um, here, I'll do like a, I guess that's an overcrossing. Oh no, that's an undercrossing, sorry. Um, so here I have two tubes. Okay, so I'm in R4, so they can intersect, intersect each other, right, and pass through. As transverse, you would be careful, but um, so this is the uh, blue tube is <laughs> my depiction here. When you look at it, I thought it draws it rather clever, but it kind of looks like toothpaste or something. Um, it looks like the blue tube is supposed to be passing through the interior of the red tube, right? And so I'm going to draw that as this is the little one going through right so the red is over the blue right and if i have the opposite um orientation if i had the opposite situation with the red going through the blue then i would swap i would write that as an under crossing okay so these are these are ways that you can think of the tubes all knotted up in space in four space now these foam vertices um so these are a bit of a a weird thing um so what happens is you can imagine that your blue tube, so here I've tried to draw the flying rings picture of this. So imagine this blue tube here enters the red tube, but doesn't exit and sort of travels alongside the interior. And we could allow this thing to merge 
or split. So if their tubes are framed, you can pull them off one another. So, so what's the material of the tube? Um, this is just an, an, any embedded surface. Um, my student who is watching um, pointed out that they're ribbon tubes, <laughs> and so they have a filling. So yeah, it's, it's any embedded surface in R4. So I want like um, any sort of angle thing. So I can have closed surfaces, for example. I haven't talked about an annulus, but you can have that. Um, and I have here, like you can have these capped things. I haven't really discussed it. So you, you could have like a closed tube as well. Um, but it's it's not completely embedding, so because I'm also going to allow some singularity, but mostly embedded surfaces. Now. These are the only singularities I allow are these foams. Okay, let's say we want to write down what these foam surfaces are now um, in some finite presentation case. And so that circuit algebra stuff, and I'll, there'll be a better picture for all this stuff on here. Um, I want to capture all these tangled surfaces in R4. And I can write it down um, algebraically now as this circuit algebra, which is generated by, I have here over and under crossings and vertices. And then these uh, caps, this is supposed to be like a, like a tube that has a disc glued on top of one of its boundaries. So you can glue that plus relations and operations. And the relations are these, uh, right, these are the frames, the ribbon right removed. Um, some R4, which is about how vertices interact with crossings. And then this relation about how you can pull, like if you glue a disc on top of one of the tubes, you can pull it through, you can pull things apart, help cap pull out. It's not really important for this talk that you understand all these things, but it's important to know that I can write it down explicitly. That's, that's the point I'm trying to make. I can really say what's happening here. So let me just see if I can, can elaborate a little. So remember, um, I, I was talking about these disks with holes. All right, so I was talking about these disks with holes, and I have some points on the boundary. And I want to say, um, if I project one of these tangled surfaces in R4 into the plane, I might get something that looks like this disk here with these circles. Now, if I want to write this down as an element of a circuit algebra, literally an element that's been generated by things, I remember these are my generators. So I've got my over, that's an over, under crossing, over and under crossing and the vertices. And I can look at how this was generated. So here, I can say that, oh, I glued here, a vertex was glued. And here, one of these crossings appeared. And here was another crossing and another. And so um, now these here, these uh, virtual crossings, they're not generators because I'm allowed to have an immersed one manifold. And, and also the, it's not really an interesting feature of my thing, right? Those are just tubes passing by each other in space. So I don't really want to keep track of it. All right. So what I'm saying is that you can look at this um, immersed surface here as being basically the tensoring up, the wiring up of these elements. Okay. So this is a way to formally say that I have a finite presentation of all of these W forms. Okay. So that's what we want to use the circuit algebra language for. So these things are really related to a categorical notion that I know um, well from deformation theory called a linear wheel prop or a prop. Uh, this is something due to McLean, and it's just it's a category. So I'm going to explain it quickly, um, as it's like a formal way to put circuit algebras um, in the same context as um, braids and categories of braids. So what, let's say what it is. So a linear prop P, so this is now like a very straightforward object. This is just a family of objects that are indexed by two integers, so vibrated sequence. And this is a um, strict symmetric tensor category. 
And I say the monoid of objects is generated by a single object. And you have absolutely no reason, you don't have to know what that means. Um, I'll show you what that means. This is a category where a typical object is, so X is gonna be something special, my generator. And so a typical object is some X tensor to the N. And a morphism is gonna be, well then a map between X tensor M and X tensor N. So since there's some category theorists around a lot of um, people tend to suppress the generator in category theory and they tend to just write this. So, um, but the generator is important in this sort of topological context when so keeping track of it. Um, right. So the, the morphism is just something that goes from X tensor M. And how we deal with this, how we write this down, right? Instead of an arrow, like from X to Y, so usually in a category you write just like an X goes to Y, right, as your morphism. You want to be able to keep track of the fact that you're coming from all these tensored up powers. So you write those as in terms of directed um, connected graphs, well, directed graphs, sorry. So here I'm thinking of, I'm replacing the, um, the object is decorating all my edges. This is going to be x tensor 3 to x tensor 2. And the, vert, the vertex there is f. So you replace your morphisms vertices. And this is a nice way to work with, with props. Uh, right? And then since p is a category, we have composition, which means I can get really complicated graphs out of this just by gluing graphs together. And this is just a... Um, composite of G and F along X tensor two, X squared. And the fact that it's a tensor category means that I can just, um, that I get some stacking, right? So if I have a tensor product of morphisms in a tensor category, this is literally just, you just look at them as being stacked up. It's a disjoint union. Oh, that guy grew an extra leg. But I can just stack. So another you know, tensoring, uh, tensoring morphisms together just looks like stacking them next to each other. So you get like disconnected graphs. And a wheeled prop, the thing that uh, is in our theorem, well, this is a prop that's rigid. So this is a tensor category in which every object has a dual. So it just means that there exists some type of abstract trace operation, which in this language, I'll write down as I've got my graph and I can have loops. I can think of, uh, way, there's ways to do killing, uh, killing forms or degenerate forms, non-degenerate. Okay, so um, these, these things come up in, um, in BD algebras and, and deformation theory, it's normally where I've seen them. Um, and now also topology. Okay, so that's that's the define of the objects. Great. So with uh, the first thing that we started with this project is just putting everything on, on again some formal language, and there's an equivalence of categories between real props and circuit algebra. So you can write these tangle diagrams and you can do all of this combinatorics and label bookkeeping, or you can um, write them as sort of morphisms and categories. So, and, and the proof is exactly that you, okay, it's actually not that much harder than this, although it's annoying to keep track of all the labels. You take this immersed one manifold and some disks with holes and you construct a directed graph out of it um, where the, holes go to vertices in a graph and any little stray pieces are just um, edges of graphs that are hanging out. So these are, um, I always call them generalized graphs. So I feel that graphs without vertices are weird, but um, that's also probably not a great name. So, um, but yeah, generalized graphs. Okay, so in other words, what, what's going on in this example. If we're like revisiting this example, um, our foams, 
right? So again, we, we started with this very geometric thing. We've reduced it now to something quite categorical. So these are um, the generators here are like generating morphisms in a category. These labels are basically just telling me if I'm, you know, going from X tensor four to X tensor three. So it's a bunch of like tensoring products. And um, the, yeah, so the one manifold is parameterizing objects, or it's really not even, I mean, it's not the one manifold, it's the labels, as you mentioned. The labels are the objects, and the way that the labels are assembled are objects. And these operations are morphisms in the category. Okay, and I've, um, I'm lying, we're not going to make this precise, um, <laughs> takes a little work. Now I've put some different colors on my generators, and that's because this structure is a bit, having it categorical like this, you can pull things apart a bit to understand what's going on with the, the structure. and. Um, and you see this reflected when you construct not invariants of these objects. And in fact, there are two layers happening here. So the red layers, these will be sort of the interesting um, morphisms. And the black, the vertices and the cap, these are going to be things we're going to call a skeletal feature. Um, they're basically also objects. And we'll use that here. So, this is an example of a wheeled prop with a skeleton or, um, or a circuit algebra with a skeleton, whichever one you like. And what we're saying is that there are some free parts to the construction. And this free part is going to be the freely generated object by vertices and caps. So these weird singular surfaces or um, the sort of part of them, um, plus some operations. So I haven't really talked about operations because they're quite annoying. Um, they're not annoying. They're, um, they're sort of outside of the structure, uh, kind of like having like a inner product on your vector space or something like that, like a little extra structure. One of them is um, something like unzip is what it's called, which is if you have the composite of two of these vertices, so you have the tube fly in and then fly back out, that you can use the framing that's there and push them apart. So, um, you can imagine that that takes a while to explain, which is why I've only drawn a quick picture and we'll ignore it. Yeah. But the, the, the vertices and the, the cap are somehow a, a skeletal structure. And we'll just say that that means that there's this free part, there's like a projection onto this free part, the skeleton, and these crossings are really the interesting generating morphisms. So if when we get to the not invariant part, basically the crossings get flattened out. They, um, they become, if you've seen universal finite type invariants or Vesuvian invariants before, they sort of get flattened out in the associated graded. But the skeletal part tells you a lot about this associated graded. And that would, that's what happens next. Are we on time? Okay. I'll go relatively quick. So what we use the skeleton for now is to actually complete them. So I won't say too much, but um, how do I get these expansions? How am I going to build um, one of these not invariants that happens to be a KV solution? And one thing that goes into this is something that comes from rational homotopy theory, which is um, we'll just call completion. So pro unipotent completion between the ring. So what do you do? Um, well, you take you take your phones now, and I'm going to index them by their skeleton. I'm going to look at the black part, not the red part, and I'm going to use that as a new indexing set. And if I take formal linear combinations on that skeleton, um, I'm always working in Q. Um, then I can define something simple, like an augmentation ideal. An augmentation ideal is a subspace of this vector space sort of freely generated by all the phones um, where the coefficient is not zero. Seems like a good definition of an augmentation ideal. 
And then you can do the, um, the usual thing in algebra, sort of iatic completion, which is just taking the inverse limit of um, quotients by powers of the augmentation ideal. Now, the actual difficult part is to check that all this sort of circuit algebra and the way these things glue up together respect that limit, right? That's, that's a non-trivial thing to do. Um, but as far as if you're just thinking about vector spaces, this is something that you've probably seen and maybe weren't even aware was interesting in, in your you know, third year algebra classes. Um, and if there are any homotopy theorists, then this is also sort of how you do rational completion for spaces. All right, so the completion is well defined. So now I can tell you how to do expansions. So a homomorphic expansion for foams. So you take this completion. Um, so you've made your you've made your topological objects into a finitely presented thing. You've now made that thing algebraic, right? I made a bunch of Q vector spaces, and I completed those Q vector spaces, and now I have this algebraic thing that's glued together via these wiring diagrams, and that's Q W hat. QWF hat. And that goes to um, a homomorphic expansion is now a skeleton preserving map that goes from this completion to um, some associated graded, okay, which is something that comes up naturally when you've done this iatic completion. And those are, um, right, and I want these to commute with all the operations, that's the hard part. And it satisfies that on the associated graded, this is just the identity. So in other words, a homomorphic expansion is an isomorphism between a completion of this topological object and some and its associated grade. Um, these are by, ne by necessity, this condition means that this is an isomorphism. Again, that's not super trivial to prove, but it's not unbelievably surprising if you did. Right? And the theorem now um, that we have from Barn and Dancho in this language is that you all of these homomorphic expansions, these isomorphisms of these algebraic objects are solutions to the question of their equations. Okay, so I have a little summary thing. So, so far, right, we have explained, I hope, maybe, um, how some things, some topological objects um, can be finitely presented. Algebraically. And um, from, that, from that description, from that language, we've been able to see expansions are just nice isomorphisms. And um, those happen to be equal to KD solution. Great. Now with um, 60 minutes or 60 minutes? 60. 60. Okay, good. I can actually tell you a little bit more. Um, okay, so now why um what's the actual interesting part i mean that part is is fun and technical but it's also um mostly there to make this next part true <laughs> um, okay so i want to tell you a little bit about um Kashiwa Fern and how these completions actually end up telling you something algebraic so a derivation of freely algebra on n letters right it's going to be called tangential tangential if we have some tuple and we have Lie words. So AI is, is a Lie word in the N. So I want a tuple of N of them, such that um, the, act, the action on each generator of the freely algebra is given by conjugation with the I Lie word. And I think, I think if you've read Drenfield, he calls these special and these something else. Um, and if you write Alexia and Tristian, then they call special the ones where um, a tangential derivation where if you act on the, the sum of all the generators, that goes to zero, right? So it's, it's just one more condition on these tangential derivations. All right, so 
I want to talk about these group of symmetries that act on the solutions of the KV equations. And um, so you can describe them um, as you know, the, the group associated to Lie algebra, which are special derivations with vanishing divergence. And I'm not really going to tell you too much about what divergence means, but I did write down presentations. Right, so what a, uh, what a vanishing divergence condition is, is that there's, um, so I want to find some tangential automorphism. I've now written the big capital T for the group thing. This is the group exponentials of the free algebra, um, which, you know, so F is going to act, it's going to be on each generator by conjugation and uh, fixes the uh, X plus Y or X1 plus X2. And then the vanishing divergence is just saying that there are some power series um, such that the, the trace of that power series where you take the Kimmel Baker Hauser series um, and then the X, Y, and then vanishes. So we want to trace things. It's a fun thing to talk about in general, but at least I wrote it down too. And then there's a, a similar symmetry where it's it's more of a multiplicative version that's going to be KB, and it has the same divergence condition. If you want like a more, I can write down the trace carefully after the talk. Okay, so recall that I had this thing where you do this completion operation and then you get something, some associated gradient. So because this completion is done very systematically and you have this finite presentation, you actually get like a presentation of the associated gradient. It comes out the other side, okay? Um, and uh, I, I think, so this is a type of Jacobi diagram. So what these are, um, Juju and Dror call them W arrows or something, but they're like a Jacobi diagram on W fold skeleton. So the skeleton part is like the, the basis and the little red arrows that's coming from the crossings. And it gives me um, some kind of thing. So in fact, they correspond to um, tangential derivations, right? So if I draw, here's an element um, of this arrow diagram space. And it's, I've got this little tree on these two skeletons on this. So the skeleton is the X1, X2, it's the straight arrows. And this red one here, and what does this look like? Well, this is X1, X2, I have a bracket, a Lee word for the, the vertex here. And now I've got another X1, probably not great. And then uh, that comes from this guy, from this vertex. And now with the arrow at the end of the tree, this arrowhead is landing on X1. So this tells me that this is some A1 and I have U equals A1 zero. It's a tangential derivation. So I can actually like, it's a diagrammatic language for these um, tangential derivations here. So by, by construction, you end up landing in, um, in the same space, at least, of these symmetry groups for, um, for the KV solutions live. And the tangential automorphisms, like so to summarize where we have the formalism, these are the morphisms in this category. All right, so now, um, yeah, the punchline, or I guess I'll finish five minutes early, maybe, um, is that you have um, automorphisms. So I want to pick a special, a subset, but if I take automorphisms, um, which fix the skeleton of, of this big arrow diagram thing, then, um, and I fix this thing, this crossing, then there's an isomorphism of groups. So this automorphism group is this symmetry group on KV. And similarly, um, the automorphisms of phones, so this, I'll put the hat there, the completion of the phones, because it better be algebraic, um, that's going to be this multiplicative version of this other symmetry group here. And they're, they're sort of non-canonically isomorphic groups that act Right, so I had my solutions to the KV problem. And here is this graded ARV. And 
uh, what you can deduce here is that you have this, these isomorphisms from our foams to this associated graded. And so each one of these isomorphisms gives you a non-canonical isomorphism to the symmetry. And they also have nice presentations, so you can again do the thing where you act infinitely to generate new solutions and or expansions. Um, I was going to say something slightly about the, uh, the proof. I guess I will just say that there are some, it's quite, it is actually quite topological in some place. So one of them is that, right, you, again, you can have these arrow diagrams on the foam skeleton. So you do in fact have things which are tangential derivations living on top of these weird foam vertices. And you have relations in this that pull them apart um, so that you can actually like, right, this wouldn't be a tangential derivation. You have to be a little bit clever about it. Um, and then in fact, there's quite a lot of, um, the, the fact that you can pull apart um, vertices plays a, a crucial role in this kind of understanding. So there's still, there's still some topological piece hanging around on the skeleton. Like it became categorical, but it's also not. So it's neither algebraic nor topological nor particularly categorical. Some hybrid beast um, situation of these things. But yeah, that's that. All right, I will stop there and answer questions. So thank you. I'm kind of curious about the method for filling these apart. Like in what language do you express them? <laughs> you can express it uh, formally and just saying that you, um, let's say I want to talk about this composite. Right? Yeah. Okay, so this is a skeletal thing. So let's say I want to look at foams on the skeleton, right? So we'll call this S. So I have this set of foams on S. Okay, um, so there may be um, some kind of no. This would just be like a one element set. But anyway, so you just you just have to force an equivalence on this right so you put a relation um where we force this to be equal to um, this so this is unzip right, you can do that oh i can yeah. um yeah you can you can do that if, and then once you've passed this completion um, thing. So now you're in vector spaces, then you literally want to, um, I mean, you're not just in, in vector spaces, you're kind of in co-associative co-algebras, but vector spaces. You can induce a, a, an isomorphism of um, vector spaces in the same thing. Um, but it is something you have to force. It's not, it won't come immediately from the structure. What it is, is a way of parenthesizing, right? So you, you can't parenthesize tangled objects. But um, I mean, the fact that Drenfield associators play a role here means that like parenthesized monomials live somewhere, right? That, that some sense of associativity of the homotopy or a weak associativity is living in the space. So the fact that, that um, if you want to get the associator part, like, right? So if you just look at braids and you want to build an expansion, you won't get this equivalence with associators unless you add parentheses, because that's what captures um, it, um, you know, the, the associativity isomorphism for braided monoidal categories or um, whatever version you've got, right? So then when you have these tangled surfaces, you have to somehow encode, again, a notion of parentheses. Um, I have seen kind of sloppy, I mean, there's, there's no real way to do it natural. <laughs> I should, I should remember I'm being recorded. I have seen versions of parenthesized tangles and it's, it's a burden to do, right? It can, it can be done. So one way is to allow certain singular surfaces and another way is to 
um, sort of formally parenthesize. But either way, if you don't add that information, you don't get um, the sort of associativity relations. You won't have associators playing a role in your in your game. Um, yeah, something as basic as parenthesize words has to live somewhere. Yeah. Yeah.